Well, good morning, good morning. So if you haven't seen my smile, I have a new smile. I've had it for a week or two, but see, it's all smiley. But I tell you what, the bottom teeth, I gotta get those fixed because I can't chew steak yet. And you gotta have steak as a guy, right? I mean, come on. So anyway, so we're teaching about uh, finding Jesus and um, uh, I want to start out with um, saying, you know, Jesus throughout the whole scripture, especially the Old Testament, there's beautiful threads. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit today. And um, we're going to also talk about how we, how do you know, how many know God is all powerful, all wonderful, incredible, and he's in us? But we have learned somehow to limit God in a ton of ways as believers, which is unfortunate. But when you study the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, you will see them limiting God over and over and over again. It's kind of like this. God said, I'm going to lead you into the promised land, right? I'm going to lead you into the promised land, into the land of Canaan. And what do they do? Complain, gossip. Uh, You name it, they did it. And then God said, you guys are all going to die in the wilderness. So God didn't cause them to die in the wilderness, right? It was their complaining, their gossiping, their lying, their, their, their um, rebellion, which caused that. So I want to I mention this for a minute. How many um, have ever seen uh, the, the movie The Matrix? And it's older now, been out a while, but uh, I want to just read this to you. So Morpheus tells Neo, you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. Take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You know, I think with the church, we're at a fork in a road, and and I think uh, a lot of people have taken the blue pill and hold on to their lifelong belief systems, limiting God and our world and ourself about God. You know, I have talked to people and, and Christians and believers, and I have said, you know, God tells me this, God tells me that, and, and warns me here and corrects me here and tells me what house to buy, opens doors for, for um, jobs and all kinds of stuff. And I remember when I was young, um, actually, when I moved here, I was younger. It was 30, well, gosh, like 32 years ago. I was a youth pastor, and um, a big church in town of between 500,000 asked me to come and do a conference for their youth. So I'm telling the youth about how God has a plan, and I, I told them about how when I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 20 and spoke with tongues, and the Bible talks a lot about tongues in Corinthians, that when you speak in tongues, pray not unto men but unto God. How about nobody understands, but we speak mysteries, of the kingdom of God, and, you, and, and, and all kinds of different things. So I told him how God had a plan, and I got, you know, 20 years old, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I told the Lord, impressed by God, I don't want to date. Now, this isn't everybody's life, right? But it was my life. It was my life about not dating, and I want you to just open my eyes to the right one. That's what I said. It doesn't mean that's for you. It doesn't mean that's how God's going to direct you. It just means that's how he directed me. And I was clear that how uh, God can tell you all kinds of things, what house to buy, what job to take, open up doors for you, do all kinds of miracles. And so after I got done, uh, a couple of people who were part of their youth leadership came up to me and said, you can't really tell people that God is that good and cares about every part of your life. Do you know where that actually comes from? That actually comes from when, when our founding fathers were here, most of them were deists. So almost every one of them, Thomas Jefferson, you name it, almost every single one of them were deists. Well, what is a deist? A deist is that God came, planted us on the earth, went a billion miles away, away and does not really care about your daily life and who you are, and that kind of thing. He just put a plan in motion, and and now he's given you the authority to do anything you want in life, and and that kind of thing. That's what a deist is, and that's what our founding fathers were. 
most of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. So that whole mindset that God can't direct you, how many know scripture says as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sons of God there doesn't mean a child, it's mature sons of God. So if you're led by the spirit, it doesn't say do whatever you want and that kind of thing. I mean, there's, in my life, I've been led by the Spirit since that day. And a constant leading. So much so, I come into our house. Some of you heard the story. I come into my house, and I, I, um, we moved here, and housing was so expensive. I didn't know what to do, so we found a trailer. We found anything we could find cheap and lived in it. And finally, we're like, we've got to find a house. So we go look at this house on Riley Road, the one we're in now, and it was a piece of trash, and, and there was four layers of shingles up on the roof, if you understand building, you'll understand that's highly illegal, and, and old farm windows, old farm doors, electrical system, 60 amp, uh, if I talk too fast and it's too slurred, it's because of these. But anyway, so, so, uh, so I'll slow down, but I got a lot to say today. So anyway, <laughs> so, so, you know, this whole, uh, th this whole situation, we had bats in the wall, walls, and I, I mean, you name it, and the Holy Spirit said, buy that house. Now, I had never built anything, never had really pounded a hammer, never had used a saw, never had fixed a window, never had did a door, never did anything. Very true, <laughs> except for preach the gospel. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, if I would have limited God, I said, no, thank you. I don't know anything. I would have said everything of my qualifications did not qualify to get a house like that. No way. Eight months later, we move into the house. I've told that story to people, and they're like, are you crazy? Nobody can do that in eight months. I can. God can. And God connected me with divine appointments, people who knew roofs, people who knew windows. My brother came in and put in 22 windows in six hours. It would have taken me 22 years to put in 22 windows. And so um, when you think about that, that we can limit God by the way we think, the, the choices we make. When we go outside of scripture and outside of his plan, for our life, we can just constantly limit God. So, so, um, so I wrote here, let's go to Joshua chapter 1. And Joshua is a beautiful story. How many know the children of Israel, under Moses' leadership, complained, gossiped, you name it, they did everything and never inherited. And uh, it was just one problem after another. So Joshua is the next generation. And we'll look at Joshua chapter 1 in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise and go over the Jordan, which um, over the Jordan, you and all the people, to the land I'm giving you. Well, what did God just say? Arise, go over the Jordan, to the land I'm giving you, right? That's what he said. The children of Israel, every soul of the, uh, every place the sole of your foot will tread, I have given to you. Sounds like our new covenant that I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any means hurt you, right? Kind of sounds like that. Looks like God's saying this way back then. As, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea towards the growing down of the sun shall be your territory. Did you know that they never took the land of the Hittites? Never did. Never got it. Never inherited it. But did God say take it? Did they get it? No. Here's even Joshua, which is a type of Christ in, in, in Scripture, but they still didn't inherit all the land that God said. So we'll keep reading. So no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That sounds like new covenant. 
I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? So he told us back then, and so that the people didn't believe it, that God would never leave him or forsake him. And, and, and so do we believe it? Do we believe, we believe that God is in every situation of our life? He'll never leave you nor forsake you, even if it looks like everything is horrible, right? You can go through some pretty nasty things, and, and it can feel like God has left you. But if you will renew your mind and say, God will never leave me nor forsake me. He is my God. He, I'm led by him. I am directed. You see, what happens is if you don't believe something, it's usually because you have something of the past that, that people left you, people deserted you, people didn't care about you, uh, whether it's family members or whatever. So you literally have to reprogram your brain to actually believe that God will never leave you. You've got to understand these children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. They had a mindset of slavery. So we have that mindset still today in cultures. And so they had a mindset of slavery. And so to come out of that, God is reinforcing, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will always be with you. And so, and so let's keep, keep reading. What verse are we on? 15? Oh, 5. Okay. All right. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As with Moses, I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be strong and of good courage. For to this people you should divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. You notice he keeps saying this? He keeps saying it. Only be strong and courageous. You can do it. You can do it. And here it's recorded. This is, this is God speaking. Yeah. I mean, you know, that'd be like a personal word to you. That would have been like me getting a personal word by that house. And then I'm like telling God all the reasons I can't do it. Right? And, and, and then God would say, buy that house. Well, by the way, somebody beat us to the offer and got that house and was going to get the house, okay? And I went to the Lord and I said, hey, you said that was my house. And he said, wait two weeks. They came, the city did township, came and cut down two trees in the front yard, one by our one side of our driveway, one on the other, the guy who had gotten the house called them and said, I don't want the house anymore. They cut down two trees. What sense does that make? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but it does to God because he knew in two weeks they were cutting down those trees and that house was going to be mine. Yeah. <laughs> you see, I could have complained like God, Somebody beat me to it. You lied to me. You didn't tell me the truth. I got an obstacle now. What am I going to do with this obstacle? Right? I could have done that. But see, I've learned enough where God has directed me enough that I knew his voice. See, the Bible says the voice of a stranger we will not follow, but we do follow the voice of a, the stranger, which would really be all the obstacles that are placed before us. But the voice of the shepherd, I hear. And so, did it, is it logical sense that I would have to wait two weeks to get a house and somebody would cut down trees? That makes absolutely no sense. If God would have told me that in advance, oh, the, by the way, they're going to cut down a couple trees. Somebody, I'd like, real, nobody will cancel. This is my brain. Nobody will cancel an offer because two trees are missing. My logical brain, I'm like that. I would have thought that whole thing out. But see, God just gives you the peace you need. <laughs> it's just that's the way he works. So... All right, what verse are we on now? Okay, I think I already said that. Only be strong and be courageous. That you may observe to do all the law 
which Moses my servant commands you, do not turn from it from the right or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go, and the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night and observe all that was written. So it's the same thing today. God says the same thing. Meditate on, on Scripture. Uh, you know, let God. But here's what it is today. This, you do it. The new covenant says, you, med you, think of, you pull up a Scripture, you start meditating on it, you start thinking on it, and then God takes his pen and writes that scripture on your heart, and nobody can take it out then. You see, there's a difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. And God never tell, tells you to get so smart in your brain. I, listen, I have studied scholars. I have studied history. Uh, I have studied the past. I've studied the whole church history of when things came in and, and how the church has changed. You know, the, they, a lot of people like go, well, if I don't have this Bible, I could never follow God. Well, then you just kicked out the first 1,500 years of church history that all of them followed God without having a personal Bible. Did you know that? They didn't, there wasn't, the Bible wasn't mass produced till the 1500s. The Bible was in the Catholic people. They had it and they read everything in Latin. And so, and so what happens is, is the early church was led by the Spirit and then orally communicated words onto each other of what Jesus taught. And so they, they were taught by, by the church, early church fathers, the first century, the second century, the third century, the fourth century, the fifth century, on and on and on, orally passed on the goodness of God and what God can do and how you can follow him and lead him or he'll lead you and guide you. So that was early church history. And so people, people will go, they will put the Bible above the spirit. This Bible, I can beat you over the head with this Bible in a hundred different ways if I want to. I can. I can. I can take these scriptures and take them out of context because that's what people do. They pick a verse. They pick a verse. They don't know how to read in context. They don't know how to study the early church fathers and what they believe. And so they believe all kinds of stuff. You know, there's 40,000 denominations in, America, in the world, I mean. 40,000 people, groups, that are interpreting the Bible in a different way. 40,000 of them. And everybody says theirs is the right way. Everybody. But see, when God writes on your heart a scripture, and he says, I'm a good, good father. Well, I didn't have a good father. I did, by the way. But, it, but a lot of people didn't. I had a good father. You know what I watched my father do? He would be in prayer. My father only had like a sixth grade or eighth grade education six or eight, but he had a major brain injury when he was young, and so he was more like about a 12 to 15-year-old. But this is what I saw. He went to work every day. He took me to church every time the doors were open. He showed me the love of God. He actually beat the daylights out of me, too, by the way. But, <laughs> but I needed most of it. Most of it. Not all of it, but I needed a lot of it. So, but here's the thing. I saw him. I came downstairs one time, and, and, and his grandson was going through struggle, and he's praying on his face, crying out to God for his grandson. And that's what I saw. So people who taught me all this legalistic stuff and beat me over the head, that, that affected me, but not as much as my daddy affected me. I saw the goodness of God in my daddy. I saw God take care of a guy who should have never been able to take care of a family. But I saw it. I saw the goodness of God. I saw a praying daddy who loved me to pieces. 
But see, we all develop all kinds of mindsets. We do. We limit God so much. It's kind of like this. One of the mindsets I had was I was super stingy, right? I just wanted to ask my kids, did I give you candy when I had it? No. Yeah, say it louder. No. <laughs> what dad does that? One who's stingy. One who likes sugar. <laughs> One who likes sugar. <laughs> well, you know, here, here's the thing. Here's, here's how you limit God. It's a mindset. And, and so, listen, I had quoted scriptures, like, given it shall be given it to you. Good measure, perhaps down and shaken together. Running over, men giving it to lose What measure I meet is measured back to me. Uh, I'm a giver. God's a giver. I'm a giver. God's a giver. No, you can't have my candy. <laughs> right? Yeah, because I'm limiting God. And so, and so, as a result of that, I had to have an experience but see, I trust the Holy Spirit. I'm going to God and going, I'm stingy. I, and I don't know why. So I go to a conference, and there's 1,500 people there, and a guy named Jack Frost was there, and he's teaching about the Father's heart. That'll mess you up when you start hearing about the Father's heart, and the Father's heart is always to give. I remember when I first got a hold of Grace, I would take my son to the store, or if I went to the store, I'd buy him a, 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 a figurine, because Israel loved figurines, and I'd buy him a figurine, and Cindy would say, why are you doing that? And I said, because I want to. <laughs> Every week I'd buy him something. He said, why are you doing that? He doesn't deserve that. He hasn't done anything. And I said, I don't know. That's just what daddies do. They bless their kids whether they deserve it or not. And that's what God is like. Whether you deserve it or not, he just blesses you. But we can limit God because, see, God wanted me to be a giver, my kids' hearts to be changed, and me to be able to, like, oh, you need help moving? And guess what? Sometimes I was the only one that go and help them, people in our church. I'd be it. Well, I drag my son a lot of times. That's what good dads do because they're training their sons to help people, right? And so, and so anyway, I don't even know where that story, why I started that story. But anyway, I went to that conference, and 1,500 people, the Holy Spirit's doing surgery on 1,500 people about their belief systems. And he came to me, and he said, here's what happened. You were 10, and you were, go after church, we would go buy Henry's hamburgers. It was, a, it was a whole lot better than McDonald's, I can tell you that. It, we didn't have a McDonald's then. So this is way back in 1967. But we didn't have a McDonald's in, in Lansing. So, and, and we begged Dad, please buy us some stuff. And he said, no. So I, in my heart, judged my dad as stingy, and he didn't love me. Uh, of what experience God opened my heart and said this is why you're stingy I asked God to forgive me and then I forgave my dad uh, forgave myself for that belief system and since that day everything is changed I stopped limiting God And I cannot tell you how many financial miracles God has done as a result. So we're in Boeing. We're youth pastors, you know, and uh, love the kids. And a couple of our kids are going to go to Bible college. So God said, I want you to sell your van and give it to them. I would have never done that before, ever. Until I, and, and, and so... At that time period, of course, I did this. Actually, uh, uh, sorry, I should change that. I actually did this before I got the revelation of my stinginess. Because, you know, what happens is, in the middle of your mess, God does miracles before you're even changed. So we gave. We moved here shortly after. And God moved on somebody's heart to take care of all three of my kids and send them to Christian school. Free. Free. 
Isn't that true? Yeah. Either two or three years. And, and took care of them. And so God just started doing stuff like that. And, and, and then we start seeing miracles, like me and my wife, we had moved here. We were $10,000 in debt. Back then, that was a ton of money. That's like 100000 now, you guys, because our money is like, you know. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> and so we're 10000 in debt, so we go and we pray. And we wrote it all down, and we said, God, we need a miracle. You see, I'm jumping way ahead, but because I'm going to, the quantum and phys, physics and entanglement, this is part of that. But I'm, so what happens is when you pray, God goes and speaks to somebody who has the means to do it. Why? Because we're connected to each other all over the world. And so... God speaks to a guy in our church, and um, we are just youth pastors at the time, and he came to our pastor and said, I have a, a big gift, and, and so he called us into office. He said, um, somebody's given you a large gift. My brain, because I'm still limiting God, is thinking $500, that's a big gift. Back then, that was a big gift to me. But that is not what I asked for. You see how God, God will just go, oh, you're so cute, son. You think $500 is a big gift? Oh, I've got a whole lot more than that for you. So, so even when we're not perfect, you guys, God just does exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or even think. Right? And so, and so he calls us $10,000. Here's the only mistake I made. I should have asked for 11. You know why? Because I should have gave 1,000 to the church because of thankfulness. And we talked about that, did we not? Yeah, so we did pay our tithe of it, and we were 1,000 short of paying it, but God helped us get the rest done. So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times, now I've had the revelation, now I'm understanding giving, and I'm understanding why I was stingy, and I'm just working at a church, building a church building, guy stops by and hands me $10,000 to help us with the building. And then, he's, he's, he's a very rich guy, and um, we didn't know him that well, but then he's over in another country, teaching medical stuff to them. He was a medical doctor. And God speaks to him again and says, I want you, that pastor is working on your church. And you go give him $5,000 personally. See, when we stop limiting God, you, see, Scripture says all things are possible to those who believe. But we struggle with beliefs a lot. And so I need to jump back to Joshua's story, but here's the thing. That they didn't take the Hittites. Remember I said they didn't take that land? Hittites mean terror or terrible. So in the Hebrew. So when you're looking at them, the Hebrew people are looking like this is a terror group and they're terrible. We're not going to go against them. You see how he already said every place you put your foot. But they never got that. But they got a lot of land. They just never got that one. And I think sometimes we limit God in many ways that way. Um, out of belief systems. So... So that's Joshua... And the Old Covenant is a type of this. It's a type of the law, and the law can only get you so close to God. It just is. The law is just... Now, Joshua came, and Joshua is a warrior. And you can only get so much by fighting for something yourself. You can. You can, you can go, 
throw caution to the wind, work 70 hours a week, work yourself into exhaustion, and you're going to earn, earn money. But your kids are ignored. Your wife is ignored. And you're hurting your family. But you can do that. But wouldn't it be better to just sow seed and ask God and believe that he loves you and cares and he wants to take care of you? Sometimes we just run and work, work, work. And war, war, war. And we ask not. You got to remember, God's such a partner. I'll never leave you. Never forsake you. I'll always be with you. I care about what you care about. This is, this is the way God is. So, I'm going to jump to Joshua chapter 2. And, now let's see. We'll read 1 through 4. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Listen, the last time a leader of Israel did this, it did not turn out well. What do you mean? He sent 12 spies, Moses did, to spy out the land and how we're going to take it, right? Well, for one, you should never stick with 12. 12 was just too, ma too many people. Because <laughs> they're all going to have a different view, right? Well, they came back. And they're like going, oh, my God, the people are huge there. They'll kill us. There's no way we can take them. And the whole nation wept all night long. Now, Caleb was one of those rascals. <laughs> and Caleb's like, we can do it, man. There's no problem here. We'll whip. But you know what? The mass of people always go with the people who vote. They all went with like the nine or who gave the bad report or how it was. So later on, when Joshua and were taking this, Caleb came to Joshua and he said, I want this mountain. All those complainers stopped me from getting my inheritance before, and I don't want that to happen again, and I want my, that mountain right there. And Joshua didn't let go, you're 85 for God's sake. You can't even fight. You can't even lift a sword. No, Joshua says, I have the strength of a 40. Why? Because he never got what he wanted before. So Joshua said, I'm as strong as when I was 40 years old. You give me that mountain. And who, what did Joshua do? He took the mountain. But see, if you believe and limit God, see, I've done a lot of study, and they actually say between 60 and 80 years old is the most productive time of a, of a man's life. And that's where I'm going. I just, I'll be 67 this year, and people go, you don't look 67. That's because I'm not 67, it's just an age. Because in your heart, whatever you believe, I, I mean, literally, I see people coming to my store, for God's sake, they're 50 and 60 years old, and they look like they're ready for the grave. And, and then I see 93 and 97 year old women, they're just walking around like, hey, well, how can I help you, honey? And I'm chasing them. They're like walking everywhere, right? Because a lot of that is your mindset. It is. There's a lot of that where we limit God and what he can do to us and for us. So let's get back to this story. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, the men have come tonight. Uh, from the children of Israel to search out our country. Now, so here they're, they're taking this, and, and here's the beautiful story. Rahab actually takes the two spies. Joshua got smarter. He only sent two spies. And Rahab took him 
took them and hid the spies because the king got word that the spies were there and went to Rahab's house. Well, this act of faithfulness with Rahab, who was not afraid and was not limiting God, she's in Jesus' lineage, a harlot named Rahab. is the great, great, great grandmother of King David. And so she didn't care. She's like, here's what she says. I don't have time to read all these scriptures. Here's what she said. The fear of you guys, because you know why? We heard God took you through the Red Sea and destroyed all the Egyptians. The fear, this is what she said, the fear has come on our people and they're shaking in fear. And this, uh, she, so she knew God had already prepared her for these two spies because she knew that she could have been killed by the king, but she didn't care. She knew that if she helped them, that she was going to be saved. So the beautiful thing is in the story is they told her to take a scarlet thread and hang it out her window, and when we come and destroy the nation, we will leave you but you got to make sure your family, all your kids, all your brothers, sisters, everybody is in your house. That scarlet thread is throughout Scripture. It's always about the blood. It's always about the cross. It's always about the goodness of God. It's always about salvation, rescue, and all that. So i got to show you something. This morning, I've known this for a long time, but I actually found somebody who wrote it. So the scarlet thread throughout Scripture... Um, they would use scarlet. They'd use that dye in, in all the temple and everything else. And so how that came out of was that, that in Psalm 22, it says that I am a worm. Okay, that's kind of weird. And you're like, okay, a worm. And this is talking about Jesus, by the way. And it's a prophetic scripture on Jesus. It's Psalm, I think, 22. It could be verse 6. It's right in that area. So, so... Um, so the worm here, actually, they would crush it, and that red dye was in that. So this is a super cool story, so I just got to, I'm going to just pull this up because I'm probably not going to get any farther. Okay. So, so this whole thing, it's like a worm of a moth or something like that. Said, so part of it is she would take it and she would excrete this beautiful red dye in the area she was having her children, or whatever you want to call them. Um, the young were ready to leave the shell after three days. The mother being still attached to the shell and to the tree dies so that she can birth a family. On day four, the mother's tail pulls up to her head, making a heart shape, heart like shape, and she's no longer red. She is now turned white as snow. And that's why they use it as Jesus, because he said, Our sins were as scarlet, and God has made them as white as snow. They took this beautiful picture of this worm or whatever you want to call it and it would turn scarlet and in its having its babies it would leave a scarlet mark and then its heart would 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 turn like like its tail would shape a shape of a heart and it was no longer red now and it turned white and so sometimes you'll see those on trees you guys you'll see a white thing on a tree and that's actually this what was called tolas in the Hebrew. And that's why, and it says, the wadu became white like a piece of wool. On the side of the tree, it begins to flake off to the ground like snow. And they use this 
So she, this mother, I'll just tell you a little bit more. The mother would climb up a piece of wood, mainly a particular type of tree, in order to lay her eggs. She then attached herself to the tree, a hard red shell around her. Inside the crimson shell, she lays her eggs um, and puts them under her body. The baby grubs, it's actually like a grub, are hatched and they feed on the mother's body for three days. You understand the number three in scripture? Three days in the grave and then resurrection life. Three is throughout scripture. If you study your Bible, you'll, you'll find that. So ta- Psalm 22 talks about it and the early Jewish scholars knew all about because they experienced this worm and they used that. They would use that for all the dye of it. So Jesus, in this story, Jesus takes all of our sin and dies because that's what it would do next. It would die and then it would turn white because he removed all of our sin as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. That's a, I just love that story. Sorry I didn't write it out. I would have wrote it out, but I, I knew about the story. I had studied that probably 20 years ago. And, but it's a beautiful story. And throughout the whole thing, so we either make a decision, because I have to talk later about the, um, the quantum physics and the entanglement and all the beauty that's actually part of the history of God. I want to tell you a couple little short stories. One of them was that uh, they took 75 to 79-year-old men. They took eight of them into a house. And they said this, we're taking you back to 1959. This is actually a clinical study, by the way. And they took them back to 1959, and here's what they told them. You, we're going to have music there, Perry Como. You're going to have old TV shows. It's going to be black and white. You, you cannot think that about you being late 70s. You have to think how you would act in 1959. These guys came in in canes. They came in with walkers. They came in all kinds of stuff like that. And they told them, you cannot have any help taking your clothes upstairs. I don't care if you take one T-shirt at a time, you're going to take everyone up there. So these guys, they're, playing, they're, they're living this for, for five days. Five days, these guys who are in their late 70s, that some of them were using canes, some walkers, they could only think, about 1959, guess what happened? These guys had a reversal of age because they took all kinds of pictures beforehand and after only five days. And they said they went backwards two full years. But here's the miracle. The ones who are using canes and walkers were playing touch football out in the front yard before they left. Now, how did that happen? How did that happen? Because the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So is he. You can, there's so many things you can do, but we limit God. There's so many things you can accomplish. Sometimes, if, if you'd have told me that you're going to stand in front of people to make a living, I would have told you, no, thank you, because I'm a shy person, and I like two or three friends. That's just who I am. And then God says, uh, excuse me, I'm going to take you to a place and they're going to say, you know what, after six months, I'm sorry, we can't pay you anymore. 
That was as a youth pastor. We don't have the money to pay you. And so I'm trying to find a job. So I go to a car dealership, and the guy's like, have you ever sold before? I said, absolutely not. I've never sold before. I never wanted to. And no, I, I'm, I don't want to be in front of people like that. Now, preaching is different. God would give me grace to do that as a youth pastor. But I had never asked him for grace to actually step in front of somebody and t talk to him about a car or anything. And so I, I'm kind of desperate for a job. But here's the thing. God opened a door for me and to go and preach in Illinois, I think it was Illinois, at a large church and do a big youth conference. And they paid me $1,000, which was two weeks of my pay. And we had all kinds of miracles like that. But I'm still like, God, I need a job, you know? And, um, and so I went to this guy and he's like, yeah, what, what makes you think you can sell cars? I said, well, and out of my spirit floated this. If I can sell Jesus who you can't see, I can certainly sell a car that you can see. So he told me later, he said, I was never going to hire you, and I still wasn't going to hire you. And three days later, God kept bringing that phrase to this guy. If he can sell Jesus, he can sell cars. And he'd ignore it. And then he'd come the next day. And then it came the third day. It's not surprising that it's three days. <laughs> and he called me up and said, come in. From the first day to the day I left, I was their number one salesman. Outsold the Toyota dealership. Outsold everybody in their whole dealerships. from saying I got desperate and didn't limit God. Like, if this is the job you want me to have, then I need grace. I need your ability, God. I need you to help me. So to this day, me and one other guy for furniture, we're the top salesmen in all four stores, we each did almost a million dollars this year. That is not to boast on me. I don't have that natural ability. You have to understand. This is all, all Jesus. And I tell him, I say, I bless my work. I bless my place. I bless all the salespeople. I pray for every one of them. I say, God, here's why. This is why I need to be a good salesman. I need to bless them. I need to bless my wife, and I need to bless my church. And so we just can't limit God. And the children of Israel limited him over and over and over and over and over again by their mindset, by the way they thought. Who says 70 years old? Who? Is it old in God's eyes? I just think we got to change some things. And I should tell you one last quick story. I want to tell you this. Did you know that up until the 1900s, after the 1900s, about World War I, um, it ended, they said knowledge is now doubling every century. Into the World War II, knowledge is doubling every 25 years. Today, knowledge is doubling every 13 months. Pretty soon, they expect knowledge to develop to, um, to uh, uh, double every 12 hours. Why is the church so stuck? Why aren't we advancing if knowledge is advancing? You know why? Here's what the church has done. The church that I grew up in, don't follow the scholars. And I'm thinking, okay, so don't follow anybody who has a whole lot more knowledge than you. That's dumb. So I start following the scholars. Early church history. First 500 years. What did they believe? 
and 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 so we we just are so confused sometimes when like science is bad did you know that I can show you how science is proving God more so than almost any preacher can tell you? And, it, and, and if I actually open up all that, you're going to go, why are we so far behind? Because God made this amazing creature in his image. And if God is all-powerful, all-knowledge, all-loving, all-kind, all-compassionate, why is it that the church is not kind and loving and compassionate? And Why? Because we're limiting. We're limiting God. And so, Christ made everything for us, and... I want to get to one last thing here. I just have to say it to you, so I got to get to it. Let me give you some help. Focus and tension. Be a bulldog. Think about stuff. What do you desire? What, what has God put it in your heart to accomplish in life? What do you want? You need to start consciously observing it. Did you know, here's the thing. Okay, if I had all you guys close your eyes and picture a lemon, right? I did this the other day to her. And everybody did. You don't have to do it because I don't have enough time. So, and p picture the dimples on that lemon. And then picture you cutting that lemon open and squeezing that lemon. Did you know that your body cannot tell the difference between you actually doing it and thinking it. It's a proven fact. And you're, if I did that, all you guys' mouth would have watered like you're tasting a lemon. What are we doing? See, see, God created us to have an imagination and to be able to think about the things that we could accomplish for God. It. So, one last story. There's 373 kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. And these kids, they split them into two halves. And they told the one kids uh, over, I don't know, it's a six month period, I think, or a year, they said, we're going to teach you stuff that will help you get smarter. They didn't change their curriculum at all. Not at all. And after that time period, they took the kids that didn't re get those words about you're going to become smarter and, and have better grades and all that. And they took the ones who didn't receive that message, and they didn't improve at all. But the kids who got the message and believed they were being taught to become smarter, every one of them had higher math scores, higher science scores, all kinds of stuff. Why does that happen? Because whatever a man believes in his heart, whatever you ask God, believing, You see, science is already proving so much of this, and the church is like 100 million years behind. Why? Because we've had an aversion to science, and we think science is our enemy. That's what the church... If you've been around church long enough, you'd understand that. Uh, it's true. Is it not true? So these kids did all kinds of things. I, I'll just prove this to you. Did you know that some of the things they say is vanilla? They only put vanilla dye in it, and you think it's vanilla, and you taste vanilla, and it's not vanilla. 
I'm telling you, when you think something, it becomes real to you. Maybe you don't believe any of this, but if you want to study all the science of it, go ahead. It's out there. <laughs> Brittany, you like this. So they took uh, four hotels. And the four, first hotel, they went up and said, you cleaners, everything you do here is going to help you get healthier and stronger and do better. And the other three hotels, they did not do anything. They did the study afterwards, and when it came out, the, the three that did not receive that message that they were going to be healthier and stronger didn't improve a bit physically. Not a bit. But the other ones did. The other ones got healthier. They lost two pounds. They were lost 0.5% of their body fat. They had a 10% drop in blood pressure and all kinds of other stuff. Now, how'd that happen? They believed that they were exercising when they were doing the work. You see, when you believe, see, everything in Scripture is faith, you guys. So what makes you think that you can't believe that when you go to work, you're actually exercising? I walk four, three to five miles a day at my work. I'm exercising. I'm getting stronger. Right? So when you take a scripture that you know Jesus is blessed and he wants for you, why don't you imagine it and think about the fact that God, you said, love gives. So I'm going to just think about that. And, and you'd be surprised. You're going to start thinking about all the ways you can bless your kids, your family, people, all that kind of thing. And your imagination will become real to you. And God loves it because you're not limiting him. If you're going through a physical battle, this is what I do with my shoulder because many of you know I injured my shoulder, I tore my muscle. And I say, at a cellular level, I couldn't do this. At a cellular level, you're coming in, and you're regenerating, and you're taking my cells that are part of the creativeness of your body, and you're rushing to this area to heal this area. And I thank you, Father, for it. And I thank him every day. Because I could not do this. Uh, many of you saying, you know, I always worship. I couldn't lift his hand at all. Just shortly, a few weeks ago. But now I can. It's not totally whole yet, but really it is. Because by his stripes I'm healed. Speak to everything on a cellular level. Because cells regenerate. And the cells don't... Guess what? I have too much to say today. So, <laughs> did you know that negative spoken, speaking of you slows down your cell's regeneration? And positive words make your cell regeneration be faster. They've proven that. I know I'm hitting you with science, but they've actually proved this. They've studied it. These are people, these aren't just fly by night, by the way. These studies I'm quoting you are Harvard, Harvard, our top scientists in the world. Your cell regeneration, just positive words. They said if a doctor, how a doctor says something is so important. If they say, you know what, this is going to kill you, guess what? In your brain, you already have come pronounced dead to yourself. But if they say, you know, it could be a little bit of a fight, but you might make it. All of a sudden, in your head, your body is responding to that, and your body is producing cells at a quicker level to heal yourself. But didn't you just say all things are possible to him that please? 
Didn't he say, speak unto any mountain and be removed and be cast into the sea and, sh- and shall not doubt in your heart? But see, they, per- they put doubt in your heart over what they're saying. And I have to stop because there's, I, this was a three-hour sermon. So, <laughs> But I want you to tell you, don't limit God. When he says something in scripture, he said all the promises of God are yes and amen to you. That means so be it. All of them. He said by your stripes, you are healed. So why is it the church is just as sick as the world and the church still has a 50% divorce rate just like the world? Why don't we bless each other with our words? Why don't we say, you're a wonderful wife. You're a wonderful husband. God has graced you to be a husband. He knows exactly what she needs, and he'll give you what she needs, and so forth. Why don't we believe that that God has anointed me to be a husband, to be a father, to bless my children, to train them up in the ways of God? And because out of that belief system, you're going to start doing special things, giving to them, blessing them, giving when they don't deserve it. Because you become just like Father. I only had 10 pages here, so... Okay, I need to close. I want to pray over your bodies. If you're dealing with something, I want to just quickly pray over this. Father, I thank you for quick. I bless their body, first of all. And I declare their body as God's temple. And God's temple is holy and righteous and pure and wonderful. And I declare, Father God, that you declared that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed. And I speak to the cellular level and speak to you and say, regenerate. Cancer cells die and be regenerated, the cell system, to do it quickly and to manifest healing in our bodies, the livers, the the legs, the tendons, the joints, every part of our body. Regenerate it, Father God. We bless our body. Our body is not cursed. Our body is not diseased. Our body is healthy so we can go about and do your business all of our life. We thank you, Father. We're not going to limit you. We thank you for your healing power flowing through our body. We receive it, and we thank you for it, Father. Just like Abraham, he gave glory to God. How are you going to use my body when I don't even have any way to produce a child? But he said, no, you said I'll have a child, so therefore... I will give glory to you every single day. I thank you, Father, for healing my body and healing Sarah's body so we can have a child, a promised child. You promised us all kinds of things in Scripture, Father God, that you take care of us financially, you take care of us physically, emotionally and physically. You would heal our minds and our emotions and help us so we don't limit you. We thank you, Father, for it right now. We receive it. We receive it. We receive health in our body. We receive our cells regenerating at a rapid pace because we're blessing those cells. We're speaking over our cells right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for it. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. I bless this body in the name of Jesus Christ. I bless this body to be healthy and strong and regenerate and those cells, healthy, beautiful cells regenerating in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, right now. We thank you for dawn. All of us point your hand at dawn. We thank you, Father, for your healing power flowing through her body. Cancer cells have to die. Brand new cells are coming in every part of her body, in the bones, in the cellular level. Father God, we speak to that in Jesus' name and command you to regenerate and be healthy and strong in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for it. I cannot tell you how many times we have seen stage four cancers and and things healed. Instruments taken out of bodies because we can't limit God. 
we can, but let's not. Start thanking him, whatever you need. Start thanking him and ask him whatever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive, scripture says. Ask him, thank him for it. Thank him for it. Your body's getting stronger. I don't care if it's just one day at a time. My body's getting stronger. My shoulder's getting stronger. It's getting more healed, more stronger every single day. So I'll be able to lift things and do everything I did as normal because that's what you want for me. You want me blessed. You want me taken care of. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. What? this morning that someone said that you just need uh, a miracle financially. I, I don't know. Like this, I believe it was this morning from what I was sensing that you just like, God, I just need an answer. Is that somebody in the room? No shame. Someone here this morning, Kathy. Okay, come up here. I don't have the means to meet that need, but I have $10. That's the only cash I carry. You know, we, we use our card a lot. We don't keep a lot of cash, oh, yeah. but um, I'm gonna give you the $10 as a seed, and then I'm gonna ask anybody in the room that might, by a miracle, have cash. No, I'm serious. This is what's that's supposed to happen. It's called seed for us to sow and seed for you to believe God for the rest, whatever. Because a seed might not meet the need, but that's just it, it's a seed. When you put a seed, I know Jeff's the farmer in the room more, him and Bob, you put the seed in the ground, you don't expect it immediately, no. but you're gonna from that one seed reap multiple seeds. So I need to reap, and I'm gonna reap multiple seeds by my little and, $10. And we'll, we'll sell you 50 bucks. So however, we'll yeah. need your information, okay? But see, that's what we're supposed to do today. You're supposed to have, you're supposed to be encouraged that you need something. And Jesus will do the rest. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because we love you. The family loves you. Okay, and Holy Spirit sees you, and He hears you. Yeah. It is. Yeah. See, look at how much the miracle is. We even have cash. In our Father, houses. we just thank you for meeting Nobody cares all that. her need, yes. according to your riches and glory. And thank yeah. you, Father, that you gave us the ability to help. Yes. We thank you, Father. Yeah. You be blessed and you be encouraged. Yeah, well, today's the day. And you believe God for the rest, whatever it is. It's just a seed, but, you know, God could grow the rest to meet the need, right? Anyways, that's what I needed to do. Thank you guys for responding. So let's stand, you guys. I know I kept you longer, but it could have been three hours. I tried my best, but I did go just over an hour because I think I got it at quarter after or 10 after so father thank you for today thank you for your great love for us help us not to limit you father help us to believe and trust and love and just do what you want us to do with our life our lives are so important to you we affect so many people help us to be a blessing Help us not be afraid to try new things. We thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name. So how, did I do okay? Did you guys understand most of the stuff I said? <laughs> Some of it, but that's good. So I'm learning to talk because it's what I got to do. <laughs> Blessings to you all.